I gave the GMAT, I believe, in 2017. I got a 680 at that time. Um, I don't remember the sectional scores, but uh, I was pretty I did pretty badly on the quant section. I think a, a problem with a lot of us, I think, is that, especially with me, is I sort of um, didn't really focus that much when I was doing mathematics at university or even before that during my O-levels and A-levels. I just sort of got by, got that grade and got over the exams. So normally my approach was, normally my approach before I picked up the course would be that I would look at a question, try to roughly figure out what it's asking for, then I would look through the answers to see which one seemed sort of correct and then I'd sort of start solving the question. By that time, you're probably wasted about 30 to 60 seconds. The good thing about the EGMAT approach with that is um, it's pretty extensive. It does take quite a bit of time, but it does build your principles um, for questions on the, on the exam that can be quite difficult. Hi, Shavash. Thank you so much for joining us and congratulations on your 750 with an amazing V44 and Q48. I'm sure at this point, you must be pretty happy to put your GMAT journey behind you and walk into the next phase. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it was great to get that score. Um, I wasn't really hoping for to get a score that high. I was hoping for 700. So it was a bit of a shock when I actually got it. But yeah, it's uh, worked out quite well. Wonderful. So before we really dive into your amazing GMAT journey, tell our viewers who you are. Yeah. yeah. So I graduated from the University of Nottingham. I did a bachelor's in finance, accounting and management back in 2016. I was planning on going to university for a master's program after that. Uh, I gave the GMAT, I believe, in 2017. I got a 680 at that time. Um, I don't remember the sectional scores, but uh, I was pretty, did pretty badly on the quant section overall. Um, I decided not to go to university for several reasons. Uh, started working on the sell side in research. Then I spent about four years working in the buy side as head of equity research. And uh, I've just decided to decide in the past year to go for a master's program and uh, move out of Pakistan. So that's why I was given the GMAT. And... Uh, that's how, that's where I came across a bunch of courses, including your course, and decided to go with EGMAT. Got it. So yeah. coming back into studying after quite a while, right? Why did you decide to go for a course like EGMAT? Yeah, so initially when I gave the GMAT back in 2017, I used a course called GMAT Phil, I believe. Uh, that was the name of the course. Um, I wasn't really that satisfied with that course because um, um, it was firstly, it was quite a bit more expensive than the EGMAT course, and uh, mm -hmm. it wasn't that well organized, but it did really help in terms of learning um, for the GMAT. Before I did that course, I'd actually picked up the Kaplan and Manhattan books, and uh, it's just much harder to go through uh, material on books rather than go, go through it on a computer because of the nature of the exam. The exam is based on a computer as well. You need to have that sort of analytical approach where you know um, which questions you're doing good at, which questions you're doing bad at. So that's why I decided to go with the course. Um, I chose EGMAT in particular because um, as far as the reviews I checked out, everybody said that the quant section of uh, EGMAT was one of the best uh, available. And quant was a particular area where I lacked when I gave the GMAT originally. So that's why I decided to go with uh, EGMAT in particular. Got it. So yeah. I'm glad you mentioned the quant course because you mentioned you were starting from about the 50th percentile, right? And that it yeah. was your weaker area overall. And looking at your course itself, you've done pretty much the entire course very diligently and you've also practiced quite a bit. So coming yeah. to the course itself, what uh, did the course really <laughs> help you achieve on the quant side and how did it change the way that you might have attempted quant questions? Yeah, so just to explain a bit, the course is organized in a way that uh, within the quant section, you essentially have five different sections. There's a basic section for basic mathematics skills, and then you have a section each for number properties. You have a section on geometry, a section on algebra. So I was gen I generally did poorly on all of the sections when I first gave the GMAT. So I wanted to obviously um, build up on all of those areas. The good thing about the course is, uh, firstly, the way that the course is organized. So at the start of every single section, let's say you open geometry, it's going to give you a diagnostic test where you can basically solve questions before doing the course and figure out what ability level you're at. Now, this wasn't that useful for me because I was at a pretty low ability in all of those areas. But let's say if somebody's really good at geometry or algebra, you can do that diagnostic test. And based upon how you perform on that test, the course is basically going to skip over certain areas where you're good at, right? So let's say you're good at, I don't know, figuring out areas of triangles. It's probably going to skip over the section which teaches you the foundations of how to make those calculations. So I think it can end up saving you a lot of time. Um, mm -hmm. First, two and a half months to do the course. But let's say for somebody who's go already good at quant, it could save you maybe half or even more of that time um, by simply doing those diagnostic tests. Mm -hmm. Once you're sort of done, 
uh, based upon the result of the diagnostic, it uh, what the course tells you is which basic concepts you're good at and which ones you're not that not so good at. And then you basically go through a bunch of foundation videos where you learn those concepts. So the good thing about the EGMAT approach with that is um, it's pretty extensive. It mm-hmm. does take quite a bit of time, but it does build your principles um, for questions on the, on the exam that can be quite difficult. So you know how the basics work. I think a, a problem with a lot of us, I think, is that, especially with me, is I sort of um, didn't really focus that much when I was doing mathematics at university or even before that, during my O-levels and A-levels. I just sort of got by, got that grade and got over the exams, even though I had like A's in my O-levels. But I didn't really like mathematics that much. So I sort of would have skipped over certain, certain areas. And uh, that, I think, if you have those gaps in your foundation, that really catches you out on the exam because the exam is basically testing those basic skills. It's not really any complicated mathematical concepts, right? So that's another thing that really works out well for the course. It is quite extensive, goes through the basics. And uh, the approach of the course in terms of learning how to solve questions in the proper method, right? I think that works out really well. It is a bit annoying when you're initially going through it because, um, again, it takes a lot of time. But uh, I think you would see the value of that once you get to the actual mock exams and when you come up across, let's say, a very difficult question that's when it's really useful to have that background and because you have that confidence to know that you can solve this question if you had a lot more time, right? So that really helps with those questions as well. Um, Yeah, so that's pretty much it. Got it. So you mentioned that what it helped quite a bit with was the process of solving questions. Can you tell us what a little bit more about what that means? Yeah, so in terms of the process, uh, one of the best things of the course was the way um, you start off with, with the question. So normally my approach was, Normally, my approach before I picked up the course would be that I would look at a question, try to roughly figure out what it's asking for, then I would look through the answers to see which one seemed sort of correct, and then I'd sort of start solving the question. By that time, you're probably wasted about 30 to 60 seconds, and you have only two minutes per question, right? So if you come across a difficult question, then you sort of tend to panic in the final last minute and not end up solving that question. So the good thing about the course, firstly, is that um, the first process is you sort of simplify the question that's being asked. and the thing with the GMAT questions is that they tend to be quite simple, but they tend to be worded in a way that makes them quite complicated. So the data sufficiency questions, for example, they're worded in a way that makes them seem very complicated. And uh, what the process skills helps you do with every question is that excuse me, you can basically bring the question back down to its basics in terms of what it's asking. And uh, then you can actually begin solving that question. So I think that that part is really great. It ends up saving a lot of time. The other great thing about the whole process is how you would sort of visualize what the question is asking for and uh, then sort of use the building blocks you've built up, the process skills part of the second of the of the videos to sort of solve those questions methodically. And that then eventually builds your ability quite quickly, I guess. Got it. So it seems like you took a very methodical step-by-step approach uh, to work with a topic that perhaps wasn't your favorite. Right. And you really did manage to turn around and make it a strength. I think you had an okay time with quant on the exam as well. Um, yeah, I didn't really, uh, surprisingly, I didn't struggle that much with the time um, on this attempt. Whereas on the previous attempt, I think timing was a bit of an issue. Um, I would say the main reason for that is that the questions that you have for quant on the EGMAT um, portal are actually much harder than uh, the questions on the actual exam. And I saw some, this posted by some other people as well who've taken the course. They mentioned the same thing. Um, again, that can that does mean that you end up spending a lot of time on the course. But the good okay. thing is that because you've dealt with questions that are more complex and that are lengthier, when you get to the actual exam, um, it massively helps the timing. So I would say, I would say on the medium questions on the exam, I probably got done with each question in a, under sixty seconds, and oh, then wow. that took a lot of time to spend on the more difficult questions when they come up. And you can probably even spend two to three minutes, maybe even four minutes on some questions. To sort of get those correct so um the difficulty of the questions on egmat definitely helps you with the timing on the actual exam got it that's great to know right and believe me when i say 60 seconds for a quant question on the gmat exam is a applause worthy thing in itself i can't remember much pe- many people who've told me that but yeah all right that's really really great so shifting from quant to verbal Verbal was your comparatively your strength coming in, and you did yeah. have a solid foundation uh, across the board. But you took verbal a step further. You took it a step ahead 
to get to that V44. When we look at each of these individual subsections, let's talk about them one at a time, right? How did you really fine tune your approach and reach that 99th percentile kind of a score? So let's start with SC, right? What really helped you and what really changed? Sure. So just to preface that by saying that um, I've generally always read books since childhood. You know, it's a habit I've kept up even when uh, I've been working. I think a lot of people, the problem they find is that you're coming back to the GMAT after, you know, five to six years after university when you haven't really um, studied in that, in that sort of been in that mindset. And that tends to be quite difficult. So that really wasn't much of an issue for me, which is why I thought that the verbal course wouldn't really be that useful. Um, and I was basing, mm -hmm. on, basing this off of what I'd seen in the verbal course for other sort of, um, providers, right? So mm -hmm. those courses okay. weren't really that useful. But surprisingly, the verbal course did end up being quite useful, especially with critical reasoning and uh, sentence correction. Mm -hmm. So critical reasoning, for example, uh, when I started solving those questions on my own, um, I thought I'd be fine on those. I was getting up to about 40, 50 percent accuracy on the hard questions, which isn't obviously great. Um, and those questions can be quite complicated, right? I mean, everybody might mm -hmm. think that they have a pretty logical thought process, but the questions are quite quite convoluted. So the good thing about the EGMAT uh, process with that is sort of the pre-thinking concept, which is basically that you read the question sort of, again, simplify it in terms of what the question is asking about, and you try to come to an answer without looking at the multiple choices that you have for the answer, right? Yeah. Um, I think that really helps in terms of uh, narrowing down the true answer. And uh, when I was using that approach, as opposed to just doing the questions like I was earlier, uh, my accuracy went up to anywhere between 70 to 80% on the hard questions. And uh, I guess that helped a lot with getting that B44. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So that pre-thinking approach was, it, I can see it really did transform your prep because to go from 40 to 70, 80 on hard questions is definitely yeah, quite, quite a, a feat. Yeah. It's quite yeah. a jump. Right. Yeah. So that's really amazing. And on the SC course as well, uh, you mentioned that just the structure of the course was something that you found quite uh, helpful, right? When you were looking at the at SC improvement. Yeah, so on the SC part, what I'd mention is that um, if you are, let's say, giving the GMAT and you go online and do a bit of research, um, the general opinion you'll get from people is that SC is something that you can't really improve on and you're sort of restricted to your natural ability, plus minus 10, 15 points. I would say that's not really that true. Uh, most of the verbal sort of material I've seen online, it hasn't really been that useful. Um, if you are somebody who already has a high ability, then it's fine. But if you're somebody who's sort of trying to sort of build that ability, um, it is quite difficult. The good thing about the EGMAT course in particular uh, with sentence correction is the way it, the, that the program goes over each question and answers those, right? So with every single question that you go through, for example, let's say you're doing a sentence correction question, um, the video will break the sentence down in terms of its basics, right? So what the subject is, what the object is, what the verbs are, what sort of tenses you should be using. And it has throughout the course all of these um little hints that you can sort of pick up in terms of how to solve those questions, how to pick verb tenses, how to understand um, where the question is asking you on a matter of parallelism, for example. So that sort of structured approach uh, really helps. Um, again, I, the more sort of nuanced concepts were more useful for me personally, but I can see that yeah. if you are somebody who has sort of a lower ability on verbal, um, the course can definitely help a lot. And it can, I'm assuming it, it can probably help you raise your verbal score quite a bit. Got it. So that's good insight to have, right? So you'd gone, you'd mentioned, you know, you'd gone through the courses extensively, you'd understood how you had to break these sentences down, you'd understood how to approach answer choice analysis across verbal and quant. Another very important part of your prep was practice. And you did quite a lot of practice on yeah. multiple platforms, but also Scholaranium, right? Yeah. So how did the Scholaranium tool aid your preparation? What was its role? Yeah, before I just get to the skull rainy, I'd just like to say that um, even when you're doing sort of the process skills questions and uh, the diagnostic tests, all of those things, the one really handy feature on EGMAT is that it gives you a sort of a small graph in the top right corner, which shows you how quickly you're answering that question relative to other people, right? Um, I think that helps quite a lot and sort of puts it um, into focus. I mean, if you know that, um, I mean, EGMAT, I think generally has a very high uh, average GMAT score for its uh, candidates. So you can sort of keep that in mind look at the graph and start, sort of understand where you are in terms of your preparation, right? So even before you get to Scholarinium, while you're going through the course and uh, you start to solve questions quickly, you sort of get feedback on that immediately with that sort of information on uh, on the questions. 
Um, once you're done with the course and actually get to Scholaranium, um, I really like the concept of the cementing quizzes. Um, I think in the first video it explains that if you get up to a 70% score on the medium questions and a 50% score on the hard questions, then you generally do quite well on quant. Mm -hmm. So I was a bit skeptical on how that really works uh, because getting half the questions right on the hard questions doesn't really sound that great. Um, but I did go through the course diligently, finish all the questions and all the cementing quizzes. And uh, when I did do my first mock, the score was uh, about a Q47 or a Q48 on quant. And that was then consistent across all the other mocks I did as well. So, um, so that really helps. The other great thing about Scholarinium is all of the analytics that you get. So it gives you um, specific accuracy percentages for each section of the quant section of the quant exam. And it breaks it down even within that area, right? So you can go into geometry, look at the subtopics and get an idea of which ones you're good at. So for example, for me, coordinate geometry was one area where I didn't have very high accuracy. So you can sort of get those insights immediately and then tailor your um, further practice based on that and do questions that are more relevant, right? Because if you are uh, going through quant questions overall, I, I know some people who started the GMAT and said, you know, we'll just go through all of the questions, you know, like you go through all of the past papers when you're giving an A-levels exam. Uh, but you can't really do that because the question banks are huge. And, you know, you have multiple providers, you have individual contributors with questions on GMAT club. So it's not really possible to go through that while working at the same time. Probably take you a year or two, I think, to do that. So I think it really helps you. Scholaranium really helps you tailor your practice. Got it. I think that's... Yeah. I think that's a very necessary thing because along with just, you know, the efforts that it takes to improve, time is always a critical resource for most people who are preparing for the GMAT. So having that guidance and that structure is an integral part of getting to that score in the most predictable way possible, right? Yeah, so yeah, definitely. Especially after a full day of work when you're back home, you know, you don't want to um, figure out your own structure on how you're going to do, go through the exam. And if you try to do that, and if you try to use online materials um, that are available, like open source, um, I think it creates quite a bit of anxiety as well when you see exactly how much material is available for the exam, because it seems sort of never ending. So to have like a proper specialized course that tells you what to do every single day, I think that really saves you a lot of time and a lot of anxiety. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So now you've done all the groundwork, you'd learned the processes, you'd run the right kind of practice and you'd taken mocks where you, where you were seeing your consistency in score. Right. Yep. And then you went into the exam. Given all of this preparation that you had done, did, how did writing the actual exam feel for you? Um, I think the actual exam uh, went quite well. I didn't really have much of a timing issue. I think timing is something that a lot of you worry about on the actual exam. Um, as I said earlier, the quant section is much harder on the EGMAT course. That helps massively with timing on the actual exam. And uh, the way it sort of works is, for, for, so for quant, for example, you have two minutes per question, but you're not really going to spend two minutes on every single question that you get, especially the first few questions. They tend to be quite easy. So you can get them done with quite quickly. And then that gives you a lot of time um, in the later part of the exam when you get the more difficult questions. So it helps with the timing. Uh, timing wasn't much of an issue. Um, I did get to a couple of questions which were quite complicated on quant. And uh, okay. that's when, I guess, the EGMAT approach of uh, methodically solving each question, going back to first principles, that helps a lot because you do have that background, right? So uh, what I would suggest to people is that go through the EGMAT course and at the same time, you know, learn the shortcuts as well and try to solve questions in, in uh, multiple processes, right? So on the actual exam, mm -hmm. based upon how difficult the question is uh, or how difficult it is for you in particular, you can choose to go with a shortcut or you can choose to do the whole uh, method as well. So I think that gives you um, a lot of different tools in your kit to basically tackle the exam. And that, that helps quite a bit. On the verbal section as well, I would say, um, again, that's a section that timing generally is an issue for a lot of people. Um, but the EGMAT approach, again, helps you with timing quite a bit. The pre-thinking approach for critical reasoning helps you sort of narrow down an answer before you even get to the multiple choice answers. And that saves time, even within sentence correction, if you um, stick to the methodical approach that the course advocates for, um, I think you can get questions done reasonably well as well. So I think that, and timing obviously makes all the difference on the exam. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. right? Okay, so I'm sure that when you saw that 750 at the end, once you'd clicked submit, you must have been quite happy, right? And also yeah, I'm sure yeah. you must have been relieved at the end yeah. to close this I chapter. actually had a bit of a miss up in the exam. Um, so at the test center I was at, I think they give you about eight minutes in between the exam to go out and take a break. 
um but it, at the test center i was at for some reason they don't tell you when the eight minutes are over and you have to sort of figure it out yourself and head back into the exam so i, I think i lost about um i did the verbal section first took that break and when i came back into the quant section um i was about 3 minutes late oh so the score i got on quant was despite of uh, not having those 3 minutes and i ended up skipping the final question i just chose a random answer for that so oh. uh, if i had probably gotten that correct i would have had a probably a bit of a higher score than that mm-hmm. uh, but again that just goes to show you that if there are any sort of uh, mishaps on the exam day um maybe you don't miss the mess up the timing but maybe you get nerves or something else i think um being well prepared really helps sort of um tackle those issues at the actual exam you trusted your preparation enough that even in that situation you could stay calm and still do your best on in yeah. a suboptimal situation essentially yeah yeah so i actually thought the score wasn't really going to be that good uh, because of that mishap so i was quite a bit surprised when i saw the actual score oh yeah i yeah. i think that was probably the most pleasant surprise you could close it out with Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now, you know, you've completed your entire odyssey. You've started from scratch after multiple years away from prep, managed your journey as a working professional. You've done extensively well in the course in Scholarium and in the final test as well, right? Yeah. So you've done the entire circle. So looking back at all of this if you had to give a piece of advice to either someone who's starting out or someone who's frustrated somewhere in the middle of their prep what would that piece of advice really be Yeah so the first thing i would actually say is that um when i started studying for the gmat i was targeting somewhere around a 700 in terms of in terms of my score i thought that would be quite a decent score actually when i got done with the exam and started applying to universities i realized that for a lot of these programs now um the average gmat scores are quite ridiculous right so even if you're looking at lsc for example i thought probably it's something like a 680 or 690 um but the average for that the msc finance courses is around a 720 for lsc if you're applying to oxford for example the average is a 740 so there isn't really a lot of room in terms of um not getting that really high score if you want to go to the top universities and uh, scores have i think creeped up over time uh, i think 10 years back the average used to be 700 now it's much higher So the first thing i would say is that um that's something that i should have taken into consideration before i began uh, studying for the gmat um and i'm glad that i got a high score higher than expected but that's something you should keep in mind if you're trying to get into decent programs abroad now right and obviously that then um helps make your journey easier later on as well because you can get into better companies you have better odds of getting jobs and stuff so that definitely helps so that's the first advice i would give uh with regard to the exam itself what i would say is that um again the quant course is quite lengthy but i would advise that everybody sticks with that and gets that done because that really helps you with your timing um um some people suggested that i should basically um go for an approach where you start solving questions as quickly as you can and do as many questions as you can i would strongly okay. advise against doing that as well because that doesn't really work out well because there isn't sort of a set number of types of questions that they test on the exam right you can literally get anything on the exam I mean, I I remember I got a particular quant question um, that I'd never ever like looked at before, but because I'd gone through um, the principles in the course and sort of those methods, I was able to get that done as well. So that's the advice that I would give. Um, yeah, so aim for a high score, go through the whole course, and um, yeah, don't try to sort of get to solving questions before you're done with the whole course or understand the concept. That's the general advice I would give. Um, with the verbal section in particular. Um, one thing i did was at the start of the exam i basically made a, a grid so instead of looking at the questions and reading through the answers and deciding which one to pick mm-hmm. what i did was i made a sort of like an excel grid with five columns where you write down a b c d e and then you sort of tick off the incorrect answers as you're solving the questions so the good thing with that is um it saves you time because a lot of times what what will happen with a difficult question is that let's say you read the question um maybe you read answer choice b that seems quite decent then you read answer choice c and d and those seem quite decent as well and let's say you mentally write off one of those choices right um when you're trying to figure out the final answer sometimes you might forget which choices you did not and which ones you're still considering right that under pressure that can happen and that does tend to happen on the mocks as well so if you have that sort of grid um written down in a notepad you can sort of cross off the incorrect answers as soon as sort of you figure out they're incorrect and that helps you save a lot of time um the other thing i would uh, recommend is that um you have about 18 minutes for every 10 questions on the verbal section right 
So what you can do is sort of mention those timestamps on the on on your notepad because okay. the timer on the exam I've noticed re, um, starts in reverse, right? It it yes. starts at sixty five minutes and yep. it goes backwards. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's say you're done with ten questions and you know it takes eighteen minutes to get those done, and then you have to basically look at the timer and sort of figure out what sixty five minus eighteen to figure out whether you're ahead or behind, right? So what you can sort of do is at the start of the exam just note down those timestamps, right? Sixty five minus eighteen. And then you do it again for the next 10 questions and the next 10 questions. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I'd basically do those 10 questions, not look at the timer. And once I'm done with the 10 questions, I'd then check the time, see if it matches with the one I've written down on my notepad. And that would instantly tell me if I'm on time or I'm not on time, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, when you're sort of figuring that time out on the verbal section, it gets quite complicated because it's 65 minutes. It's quite an odd odd number. And then Mm -hmm. 1.8 minutes per question is again quite an odd number. That wasn't really a problem on the con section, um, but on verbal, that saved me quite a bit of time as well. And then again, again, that helps with nerves as well. So because let's say you do 20 questions and you're one minute ahead, then you know that you can divide that one minute up with the final 15 questions in the exam. So that helped quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And then finally, I would say um, for the verbal section and reading comprehension in particular, start reading something from day one, right? So pick up any sort of dense material you can find. Uh, I guess The Economist, Wall Street Journal, you can read uh, Science Direct and those sort of journals, right? Pick those up. And I think if you're reading consistently for three to four months, that will that might not improve your um, grammatical ability a lot, but it will help you improve how quickly you can absorb passages because that can be a bit of a problem on the exam. So um, the one thing that did work for me is that I do generally read quite a bit and I picked that piece up when I was preparing for the EGMAT, uh, for the GMAT exam. And uh, as a result of that, when I was doing the reading comprehension questions, I got done with those very, very quickly because I was able to read those um, long passages quite quickly as well. Mm-hmm. So I think that yeah. helps as well in terms of preparation. Got it. I think those yeah. were some extremely practical tips that, you know, if you're watching out there, you should know those down because all of those yeah. will work for you when it comes down to D-Day, right? Yeah. And I can see that that practical approach to everything really helped you all from start to finish, right? So I'm really happy that we were able to learn all of these things from you because these are some very, very valuable insights. Yeah, that helps. And once again, thank you so much for taking the time and congratulations on your wonderful journey. All Thanks. the very best for what comes next and we'll all keep our fingers crossed for you. Yeah. Sure. All so, right, see you. Bye. Bye-bye.